thank you for joining us today and we're going to get started in a moment um but just a quick bit of housekeeping before we start so hopefully you can hear me okay that's a thumbs up brilliant um but if not drop the message on the chat function that's below which you'll be able to find um i'm going to hand over to karen and rachel in a moment um but just wanted to talk about what we were going to be going through today so if you just click on rachel so we're going to do a bit of obviously an introduction to karen and rachel and what they um do um we're going to talk about the standards and levels so um different types of apprenticeships and what what sort of is on offer um about the recruitment of an apprenticeship um karen's going to talk about upskilling the team so if you have existing members of your team that would like to do an apprenticeship obviously the benefits that the organization would get funding and training um about mentoring it's quite a large part of it and then there's going to be time for questions at the end um so if you've got any questions as we're going along if you just drop them into the chat box um, and then we'll be able to pick them up at the end. Um, I've got a few questions as well, sort of ready to answer, uh, sorry, to ask the guys. So, um, yes, so Rachel, over to you. Thank you very much. So I'm Rachel Eves, um, my colleague Karen Dodge joining us on this um, presentation. My role is in the business development team working with young people, predominantly those school leavers, um, and also employers who are looking to recruit apprentices into the team at more junior roles. Karen's role is Levy Client Relationship Manager. She works with larger organisations who are Levy payers, um, generally upskilling in the business, so team leading, management, um, and also on the recruitment side as well. So what is an apprenticeship? So this is where you have somebody in your team who's working towards a nationally recognised qualification. Um, it's absolutely key. They have to be working towards a standard or a framework if they have already joined the program. Um, what you can't have anymore is somebody who's called an apprentice, paid an apprentice wage, who isn't working towards a qualification. So that person may have been recruited into an apprentice role, or you may be upskilling somebody that's already part of your organisation. But they are performing their everyday jobs, being taught by um, colleagues and their team, and at the same time they're working towards a qualification so it's that combination and it might be that they're doing um, four days in the workplace one day study and that could be the same day every week that they're attending college or a training center or it could be blended learning um, and again they could be employed on a fixed term contract for the duration of the apprentice so if the apprentice is new to the business you may put them on a 15 month contract to be renewed at the end of the apprenticeship or they may be on a permanent contract right from the start you can also have those who are already employed who become apprentices. That is the funding stream that they use and you wouldn't change their contract of employment. Apprenticeship standards were introduced um, May 2017. They've replaced the frameworks where you used to have your VTEC and MVQ. So a standard has been created in line with industry experts. The biggest difference probably an employer would see is that at the end of the standard, the apprentice has to go through an endpoint assessment. So this is a formal assessment to make sure that an external body has considered they have the knowledge, skills and behaviours to succeed, at which point they pass the apprenticeship. So they are now pass or fail. Um, there are a wide variety of standards available. So anything office based, and that could be from customer service, um, digital marketing is very, very popular these days. Accounts and finance, so that's your old fashioned AAT, level three, level four. Um, management, which tends to be more where we upskill existing staff. Construction, so typically what apprenticeships were known as, and that's your um, electrical installations, so electricians, gas fitting, plumbers. Um, engineering is a huge program, really, really wide scope there from those doing electrical maintenance, manufacturing. Um, really widespread right the way through to um, drafts people. IT and telecoms obviously has been huge changes over the last 10 years in this industry. Um, teaching assistant really popular working with a lot of schools whether they are um, local authorities or academies to upskill the team there and to recruit in at junior level and logistics especially in West Berkshire really really strong industry on warehousing and storage. So there's a wide variety of standards out there. There are far, far more than this. This is predominantly what we deliver as an organisation. And these are um, standards that we deliver ourselves or with one of our partners who may be a specialist in an area. The level of the standard varies from intermediate right the way through to degree level. So an intermediate would be equivalent to your GCSE right the way through, like we said, to a degree, a level six, level seven qualification. 
So the level that the apprentice works at will depend on the role and, their, and the candidate and their prior achievement. The majority of hours go in at intermediate, advanced and may well progress on. Um, dream situation is where you have an apprentice that you see right the way through. Um, again, using engineering or accountancy as examples, where you funded them from school leavers age right the way through to completing a degree. And you end up with a very, very competent member of the team who's obviously got a huge amount of commitment back to you as an organisation for the support you've given them. So the levels would be discussed with us um, right at the start to make sure we get this right. So some organisations recruit apprentices um, looking at their junior roles to see where they can obviously support young people out there looking um, and obviously from the business perspective make sure that you are planning for the future. We've got over 30 years experience, we've been in West Parks almost 40 years. Um, we're able to advise employers on job descriptions, so making sure it is appropriate um, job description for an apprentice. We can talk to you about local salaries to make sure you're competitive. We can help you advertise and that's on um, gov.uk using your own social media. We talk to local schools, we've got connections with the schools. We're in there talking to their school leavers, college leavers. And we have three different levels of support that we offer to employers looking to recruit. Some might ask us simply to support them in the advertising process, so promote their vacancies and then enrol the apprentice. Um, and at the other end of the scale, we have employers who ask us to help create the job role, um, put together the spec. From that, we would advertise. We can do first interviews. We can decline candidates right the way through to shortlisting and supporting then the employer with their own recruitment process. I'll now hand over to Karen to talk to you about upskilling your team. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so upskilling is a fantastic opportunity to, to use your, your levy. There are a lot of employers at the moment sitting on humongous pots of money that they just can't spend. And of course, the only thing you can spend that money on is an apprenticeship. So we're, we're very adept to working with the employers, being able to have a look in the workplace and see, you know, what gaps are there? What can we do to help you actually fill that with some, some meaningful training that's going to really boost your employees, give some personal development, it improves retention. There's so many bonuses to, to actually using that pot of money to, on your existing staff rather than having to take on a new person if you haven't got the opportunity to recruit. A lot of people will ask, how does that really fit in with the everyday work? Because I guess the difference between a, a new apprentice that you've just recruited is that they come in as an apprentice and they haven't got that job role ironed out for them at the moment. They're, a lot of their time is spent training, whereas an existing member of staff, of course, has already got a, a pretty hard work schedule. We fit around that. So we do have to do a certain amount of training off the job, but we teach the, the learners how to actually fit everything into their, to their daily routine. A lot of what they're doing in their daily routine is going to be off the job training because it's things that they're learning in the qualification. So we do, we work also a delivery schedule to actually fit with the employer and what's gonna work best. But I think the main thing really to think of is that it is a, a, a fabulous way, sorry, I get so enthusiastic over this, a fabulous way of actually spending the money that you've got in your levy pot to good use. Don't waste it. You know, actually have it there and utilise it and let us help you do that. So as we've just said, you know, there are huge benefits to upskilling a member of staff. We know, that especially in the current climate and situation, that anything we can do to motivate people is second to none. We need to reward the staff for what they're going through at the moment. We need to motivate. But we also need to make sure that the bottom line stays where it is and that we're increasing productivity and service. So if you find an apprenticeship that's going to really support your team members, the enthusiasm is going to really cascade down throughout the staff, other staff members as well. 
because one of the things we do find is that people on a training program do get very motivated. It starts them looking at their job in a different way. It starts them talking to other people. There's information that they have to find out. So they'll be naturally inquiring. And that, of course, sparks conversation. And we also cover a lot about the actual workplace environment. So it's really upskilling your staff in your ways, your procedures, and the chance to really be able to make a difference. So it's a win-win situation because you get really motivated staff, you get upskilled staff, and you get an employer that sees the benefit of having the, the team members on side. Thank you, Assistant. You're doing a wonderful job. So the funding for, for the apprenticeships, as we already said it's the levy so there's a there's a pot of money there that your company is already paying into if you're a levy payer rachel will be working with companies that don't pay the levy and of course there's different um ways of funding those apprenticeships as well but if we just look at uh, look at the levy we can still we can fund a wide range of different topics here and I'll get Rach actually to join in in a minute and talk about the enhancements and the, the 16 to 18 year olds. But I think for levy payers, just remember that this can fund any age of employee. Okay, there's no age limit. In the good old days, there used to be an age cap. There isn't now. You can have a staff member of 65 doing an apprenticeship. Okay, so it really is for everybody. And might also be worth saying at this point that you can also have somebody that has previously achieved a degree doing an apprenticeship. Because again, I talk about old days, you weren't able to do that. Once you had a degree, that was it. You weren't able then to, to do an apprenticeship. That's been removed now. So the funding will still be there. Okay, Rachel, is it a good time for you to talk about your, your non levy Certainly. So Funding. if you, yes, if you were a non-levy payer, so a levy payer is a business who has a payroll of three million pounds a year or more, um, where the government will obviously be taxing you at source. Non-levy payers are smaller businesses. So typically we would always say speak to us so we can work out very bespoke um, advice for you on the funding that's available. But generally speaking, if you're a small business with less than 50 staff, and you recruit a 16 to 18 year old into the business or you upskill somebody that's joined your business who's under 19, the apprenticeships training will be fully funded. You'd still be responsible for their salary, but the actual training side would be funded. If you're a business who has more than 50 staff, or if you're a small business and you recruit somebody above the age of 18, or you enroll somebody above the age of 18, you would then be asked to do what's called co-funding. So this is where the government will part fund the qualification and as the employer you make up the difference. But that will differ depending on the business size, the age of the apprentice um, and also the apprenticeship standard that they work towards. So it's really key to talk to us right from the start so we give you a clear picture about potential costs. Um, and then, even more exciting, is the enhancements that you could be um, able to claim. So currently, for any business of any size, levy or non-levy payer, if you enrol somebody who is under the age of 19 onto an apprenticeship, you would get a thousand pounds in enhancement paid over two instalments. Um, around about month three and around about month 12, you would receive 500 pounds. Um, in addition to that, currently, up until the 31st of March, there are COVID related enhancements. Um, so at some points you could actually be receiving around about £3,000. So this differs obviously and it will change as time goes on and as, as Covid hopefully very soon starts to become less impact on a business. Um, but do talk to us because it will vary as, as time goes on. But there's funding out there, it depends on the size of the business and the apprenticeship standard they're working towards. But we can advise you on what it would cost you to actually put that apprentice through their training. Shall I hand back to you, Karen, or shall I continue? Well, this is probably a little, little bit of both of us, and I'm happy to chat. Okay, so we talked about, Rachel talked earlier about working towards an apprenticeship standard. So every single person that is a learner with us will be working towards a standard. This standard 
equip them with knowledge, skills and behaviours. OK, so no matter what subject you're doing, it could be underwater basket weaving or it could be management, you'll get knowledge, skills and behaviour from it. And this is delivered in various different ways, actually. So some the trades will actually be with our partner colleague, Ecart, and we'll be doing day release, a little bit of on-site training as well and some blended learning. If it's a, pro a program that we're delivering totally ourselves, such as our management programs, then we're doing this, of course, due to the COVID situation, everything is online, but they're, they're set classrooms. So we're not just giving the learners the materials and sending them off to do it themselves. They're, they're actually still joining classrooms. They're joining a group. They're getting that, that peer support as well. Every single apprenticeship must the person must have already achieved their functional skills. So that'll be English, maths, in some subjects, IT as well. They need to have achieved an A to C or which grade is that now, Rach, in numbers? A four. A four. Thank you. And But if they haven't already got that, not a problem. We will put them through their functional skills. So they will need a level two minimum in English, maths or IT. And as we mentioned earlier as well, endpoint assessment. Every single apprenticeship now has an endpoint assessment. The different subjects have slightly different assessments, but they're, they're basically made up of professional discussions, perhaps a portfolio of evidence that the learner has worked on. There'll be some scenario-based questions, online testing, but they do actually come out with the achievement of their endpoint assessment. And I think four apprentices, you know, they've given however long, two years, three years, four years, maybe. It's nice to actually have that assessment and know they've achieved at the end of it. Shall I talk about mentoring, Ray? You certainly can. Okay. Um, I think one of the huge advantages of working with us WBTC is that not only do we tutor the learners, but we, we're very, very strong in mentoring as well. So we will actually provide somebody to mentor the learner through their qualification, which gives them support. And I think with in Rachel's, um, some of the youngsters, this is hugely important because some of these youngsters, they know what they're doing. But sometimes they just don't know where to go and what to do with it. So we can make sure that we're mentoring them, making sure that they know how to upload all their work, what they need to be doing. So I think that's a, a huge benefit. But also in the workplace, we always ask that there is a mentor for these apprentices. So whether they're a youngster being newly recruited or an existing learn, uh, existing staff member that's on an apprenticeship, it's important that they do have a, a mentor. And we actually put on a, a free mentoring workshop as well to, to make sure that those people are supported and know what sort of support they need to be giving the learners. So we have our trainer stroke tutor that's delivering the programme and then we have our training consultant who will provide all of the support and the mentorship going forward. As I've already said just that last point there, we run workshops to actually support the employers. So I think as a whole you can see that mentoring to us, you know, the journey of that apprentice is very, very important, is key to us and that's why we have such high success rates because we hold their hand from day one right the way through to the end. And by the time we get to the end, it's quite often them holding our hands and leading us, but it's we've developed them that well. But, it's, but that's how we get our results. Great. Uh, well, thank you both very much um, for all of that sort of information. That's really useful. Hopefully um, everybody's found out a little bit there, a bit, little bit more there about uh, apprenticeships and how it kind of works for employers. Um, if you've got any questions, if you wanted to pop them in the chat function at the bottom, um, that would be great. But I've got a couple of questions here for you both. So um, first up, either Rachel or Karen, um, when is the best time to consider starting an apprentice? So if you are looking to upskill, so somebody who's already in the workplace, um, it really is a question of when they're ready. And for most apprenticeships that we offer, there is a rolling start date. 
So wherever possible, we'll accommodate them as soon as possible. So management team leading can join at any time. If you're looking to recruit, there are times of year that you are likely to get a higher number of applicants. So typically school leavers, college leavers are starting around about now. So that sort of process of what's out there, but the summer is always busier. So that's your key time to recruit young people um, into the workplace. But at the same time, I would say that over the past four or five years, we've seen a steady intake um, throughout the year and our programmes have had to adapt. Um, even over the last year, we've had to make significant changes um, to fit in with COVID because obviously that had an effect on everybody. So it's a lot more flexible now. So again, talk to us and as soon as we know the candidate situation um, and the qualification, we can give you an idea about the next intake. Great, thank you. Um, obviously, like you mentioned, uh, things are not particularly normal at the moment. So, um, and a lot of organisations are working from home, um, which with existing, employ uh, existing employees um, is often fine. But how would an employer go about working remotely with an apprentice um, if everybody's working at home now as they are? I have to say, I have been really impressed with the employers we've worked with um, over the last year. It, it was quite a mammoth move all of a sudden to remote learning from our, from our perspective and for some of the employers we work with. It's all about communication. So our advice to employers has been keep in touch with your apprentice, make sure it's regular contact, ensure that you're setting them work that they know how to complete, that they've had training to do, or that you're able to give them training on that work. Um, I am at the moment working with some employers who will be recruiting within the next eight weeks, and those apprentices will be starting the job working remotely from home. So if you're recruiting into the role, from my perspective, I do look for slightly different skill sets um, or maybe personal traits in candidates because you do need to have a little bit of get up and go behind you. You need to be confident to be able to address issues, speak to the employer if you're concerned. But it's all about communication and making sure the support's in place so they know who to ask. But it has, it, it's been a really good year on that side. Um, we've had really well supported apprentices. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so I think your hair might be rubbing on your uh, mic, Rachel. But... <laughs> um, That's because I can't get a haircut because yeah, well, no, right? <laughs> <laughs> your hair's gone. <laughs> um, so what happens if an apprentice resigns or um, is let go during their apprenticeship? So it all depends on the reason behind that. Um, it would very much be a conversation to have with us. So if an apprentice has been let go, um, we would need to know the background to that. If it's because of a change um, in the company's workload, something along those lines, we would work with that apprentice to find them a new placement. If they resign from the employer's perspective, it's no different if any other member of staff resigns. Your commitment is to that apprentice and the funding is for that apprentice. So if they leave, any charges that you're paying, if they've left your business, that would cease. Um, it's all about, again, conversations with us, but your responsibilities as an employer are the same as if they were any other member of staff. Okay, brilliant. Um, and I think Karen touched on this um, a bit with the degree um, sort of point that you made earlier, but if you've got a member of staff who has previously done an apprenticeship, so maybe when they were younger or something, are they able to do another apprenticeship with an employer? Most certainly. Um, so <laughs> most of our apprentices do what we call progress. So you could have somebody who does... Um, team leading and then moves on to do operational management, um, engineering and accountancy, the expectation is that people will progress. Equally, if we have somebody that approaches us who has a degree, so long as they are doing an apprenticeship in a different field, they can access apprenticeship funding. Um, so we could have somebody who holds a level six, level seven in architecture, who does a level four qualification in engineering. Um, it really does depend on what they've achieved previously and what they're looking to do. But so long as they are working to either a higher level or in it's a different field, should be absolutely fine. But we would always advise you on a one-to-one -one basis on that. Brilliant. I think that's really is worth mentioning at the moment, especially as um, you know, a lot of people are thinking about new careers, mm. new industries and things yeah. like that. So it's really worth sort of hammering that point home is just because somebody's yeah. got a degree or higher level qualification in a different area. It doesn't mean that they can't sort of retrain and reskill using an apprenticeship. Um, and so we, again, we've touched on this slightly, but um, just to elaborate a little bit more. So how would an employer know what level of 
level of an apprenticeship that they would need to advertise i guess it's it's quite challenging potentially if it's you know knowing if it's level two three four whatever how would that work so we'd have a conversation with the employer we would look at the specification so to complete the standard the apprentice has to hit and show that they have performed the knowledge the skills and the behaviors so we need to make sure that we can map the knowledge skills and behaviors required in the role that's being um provided that they would map across into the standard so you can't have somebody for example who takes on um, an advanced customer service qualification if in, in their role they won't be dealing with complaints um, and have a level of authority so we would always talk to an employer um, look at the job description look at the role that the person will be doing and then we can advise um, we also have what we call skill sand skill, uh, skill assessments so if we have somebody who approaches us to say I've got three years experience in my role, I'm working as a team leader. We would then get them to show us their job description, talk to them about the role to make sure again that what they're doing matches the standards so that they can get that evidence. Because quite often you'll find that companies may give somebody a job title and that can vary so much across, across industries and jobs. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so unless anybody else has any other questions or Rachel or Karen want to share anything else with us today um we're pretty much there this um as all we've been recording this so we're going to post it up onto our youtube channel so if you wanted to watch back you know a cup of tea later on um then go for it <laughs> um but then uh and also share with colleagues and things like that as well so if there's anybody else in your organizations who hasn't been able to make it today um it'll be on our youtube channel we're also going to um, post out on our linkedin twitter facebook pages and things like that as well so you'll see it there but if there's no more questions um we're good i think thank you very much for joining us and uh we'll speak to you soon thank you thank you thank you, thank you everyone